for that introduction. Um, I, I just wanted to begin by saying that uh, I'm quite humbled to be here. It was a great honor to be invited. Um, and I felt uh, even more humbled when I looked at the list of previous speakers um, uh, who have presented in the series. So uh, the first thing I'd like to do is just express my thanks. Um, what, what I hope to do uh, today is to describe a line of research that I've been engaged in over the last seven years or so that's directed at understanding how stress processes instantiated in the brain translate into risk for the premature expression of cardiovascular disease. Um, and in the course of describing this research, I hope to uh, tell you about where this research has led me in terms of what the kinds of questions that we're asking now, which relate to how um, uh, inequalities, uh, particularly the experience of social disadvantage, um, might relate to uh, physical health outcomes uh, as mediated by the brain. So, in an outline of today's talk, uh, what I'm going to do is spend a few minutes talking a little bit about the broader context for the kinds of questions that we ask. And then I'm going to move on to describe um, in some detail the research approach that we take in our research, and I'm going to focus on the brain imaging methodologies that we use. Uh, I'm going to provide an example of the kinds of findings uh, that are typical in, in the lines of research that we do, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the next steps, and here um, I thought it would be an appropriate time to open up um, for broader questions, um, particularly as they, they might relate to um, uh, health interventions and policy implications. Um, and I wanted to point out here too, uh, if at any point during the presentation uh, something is unclear or you'd like me to elaborate a little bit more on what I'm talking about, please feel free to interrupt me uh, and I'd be happy to field questions as we go along. Is that okay? Okay, great. All right, so um, as I mentioned, I'm, I can't really see the screen here. I, just want, I have two different slides up on my screen, so I don't know what you're looking at. Um, <laughs> if I understand that slide correctly, what it's meant to illustrate is that I'm broadly interested in how stress processes uh, instantiated in the brain translate um, into risk for coronary heart disease. And in particular, I'm interested in the biological and behavioral pathways that link these stress processes into cardiovascular disease risk. And in one line of this research, we use functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, to characterize particular brain areas and brain systems that are involved in generating acute changes in cardiovascular activity when we experience something stressful. And what I mean by that are these surges in blood pressure and rises in heart rate that, that we show or that we experience uh, when we're presented with a stressful stimulus or a stressful event. In another line of research, we use structural magnetic resonance imaging to characterize changes in brain morphology or brain structure that are related to more chronic forms of stress. So these are, these are stressful experiences that unfold not over the course of minutes, but over the course of weeks and months and years. And here is where we've probably done the most work in linking long-term experiences, um, particularly stress-related experiences associated with socioeconomic disadvantage with changes in, in brain morphology and brain structure. Um, in the interest in time and also um, in proportion to the work that I've done, I'm going to spend the majority of time um, on this first line of research using functional magnetic resonance imaging to look at functional neural correlates or functional brain correlates of stressful experiences. Okay. Now, when, uh, when, when Andrew invited uh, me to come give this talk uh, in, in the course of one of our conversations, he said, uh, you'll like Glasgow. It's a lot like Pittsburgh. And I, being from Pittsburgh, what I, what I heard him say was that we have terrible weather most of the year and football is very popular, <laughs> which is a good, uh, a good way to describe Pittsburgh. So I thought it was only appropriate to start with an American football story, um, perhaps the most famous uh, football story among health psychologists in Pittsburgh where I do research. And this is a story 
about the last few minutes of um, uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers and the, um, the Indianapolis Colts who were in, um, in a playoff game to go to the Super Bowl. And um, in, okay. So in the last few minutes of this all-important football game, um, Jerome Bettis, who was our star running back at the time, was uh, driving for a touchdown to win the game and send the Steelers um, to the Super Bowl. And I think this was, in, this was quite literally in the last 50 seconds of the game, and the score was very close. And in the course of driving for this touchdown, um, Bettis fumbled the football, which was a very dramatic event, and the ball, uh, football was picked up by Nick Harper of the Colts. And he was uh, running for a touchdown, and if he would have scored this touchdown, he would have won the game and um, put the Colts in the Super Bowl. The last person he had to beat was our quarterback, uh, Ben Roethlisberger, who was falling down backward as Nick Harper was running by him. And he reached out with one arm, grabbed his leg, and tackled him, and won the football game for the Steelers. Okay, so this is all a dramatic event unfolding in the course of a few seconds. So as you can imagine, you know, all of Pittsburgh was quite excited by this play, but it was too much for Terry O'Neill, who had a non-fatal myocardial infarction while watching this. And he was quoted as saying, uh, it was too much for me to handle. He was in a bar on the south side of Pittsburgh watching this, and literally, as Ben Harper was running for the touchdown, he had a heart attack. Non-fatal heart attack, he's still alive, it's okay. Um, I bring up this story because when, when most people think about the relationship between stressful experiences and cardiovascular disease, it's typically in terms of late stage events. And what I mean by late stage events are myocardial infarctions or sudden death that occur very late in the disease process. Okay? But coronary heart disease, particularly atherosclerotic coronary heart disease, is a progressive disease that unfolds over the course of decades, and it begins quite literally, you know, around the first decade of life. And cardiovascular disease progresses through these preclinical characteristic changes um, that are often indicated by the formation of fatty streaks and atheroma that lead to vessel occlusion and ultimately to plaques that may rupture um, during acute events. And my research is focuses on, what my research is focused on is patterns of stress physiology that people experience or show in the course of everyday life over, over several decades that accelerate this disease process that lead to the premature expression of these late stage events. So in that sense, what I'm going to be talking about is how stressful experiences mediated by the brain relate to these preclinical changes in um, coronary heart disease. And one of the particular um, uh, stress-related uh, factors that I'm interested in that I believe represents a model uh, process that, or pathway that links stress processes instantiated in the brain with coronary heart disease risk is what, I, is what people refer to as cardiovascular reactivity to stress. So going back um, to what I said earlier, these are these acute changes in blood pressure and heart rate that people show during an acute stressful experience. And as I'm going to describe next, the reason that this that cardiovascular reactivity has attracted a lot of attention, particularly among health researchers and epidemiologists, is that these changes in heart rate and blood pressure appear to play a role in the ideology of coronary heart disease. Okay. Now, just to define some terms. Um, Again, cardiovascular reactions are, are a hallmark of the prototypical response to an acute stressor. Um, they're in, in, reliably characterized by an acute increase in blood pressure, acute rise in blood pressure, an acute rise in heart rate, an increase in the contractile force of the heart, um, and also by uh, an increased constriction of your blood, of your, uh, blood vessels. And in the short term, these Cardio, these changes in cardiovascular physiology are adaptive. They provide um, metabolic and hemodynamic support to large muscle groups to facilitate adaptive action, like fight or flight, as expressed by this naked and enraged man. Um, and these changes in cardiovascular physiology have a well-described uh, functional neuroanatomy. And that is, that is to say that we know a lot from um, 
animal lesion and stimulation studies that there are particular parts of the brain that are involved in generating these peripheral cardiovascular changes. Um, the second point that I want to make, and this is probably one of the most critical points, is that there are wide individual differences in cardiovascular reactions uh, to stress that are linked to many um, what you can label as psychosocial risk factors for heart disease, like socioeconomic status, um, individual differences in temperamental hostility, and so on. Um, there are also individual differences in the sense, and this is again one of the most important points that I'm going to make, is that some people are characteristically high reactors. That is, some people just have a trait-like tendency that whenever they're provoked, they show a very large rise in blood pressure, a very large rise in heart rate that they display pretty early in life and it stays with them over time. So in this sense, um, you can imagine that if someone is, if someone is easily provoked and they show a surge in blood pressure every time you, know, you get a rise out of them, these are the individuals who are at risk for showing premature um, uh, coronary heart disease outcomes. And uh, just to, uh, to, to further elaborate on a point um, that I made earlier, that the individual differences in cardiovascular reactivity have long been linked to, to coronary heart disease, and that's because there's a reliable relationship between exaggerated cardiovascular reactions to stress and a number of outcomes. So for example, high reactors are more likely to show premature hypertension, so that is, if you take someone at, um, you know, when they're 20 or 30 years old and they don't have hypertension, they don't have cardiovascular disease and they're a high reactor, and then you assess their health, you know, many, many years later, you can use the magnitude of their blood pressure response to a stressor to predict whether they're going to go on to develop hypertension, um, whether they're likely to show an enlarged heart or ventricular hypertrophy, um, and also whether they're likely to show signs of premature atherosclerosis. So, um, so that, I hope, provides some context for the kinds of questions that I, I ask in my research. I'm interested in the pathways linking stress processes instantiated in the brain to, cardio, um, to cardiovascular disease risk, and one of the particular pathways that I'm interested in are these acute changes in cardiovascular reactivity to stress. And now what I'd like to do is describe a little bit about the kind of research approach um, that I take in, in, in the work that we do. Okay. So, um, in most epidemiological studies and in um, uh, most, most health psychology studies of cardiovascular uh, reactivity and health, what we do is we have people come into a lab and we have them perform uh, a task, a standardized task, that most people find distressing or stressful. Okay? And one of the most famous tasks and most widely used tasks uh, is a modified version of the Stroop color word interference task. Raise your hand if you've ever seen this task or know about it before. Okay, so quite a number of you. All right, so for those of you who don't know anything about this task, the goal um, is to identify the color in which this center word is shown. All right, and you do this by selecting the word at bottom that names the color of this word. All right, so in this, in this example, who can tell me what the correct answer would be? What's the correct? Yellow, right. Okay, so the correct answer is yellow. So down here, you have to select the word yellow because it names this color. And you have to ignore or suppress your tendency to basically want to select blue because it matches the word. Or select this, this um, the word red down here because it's in the same color. So it's kind of a nasty task. <laughs> We make it even, even nastier by titrating uh, people's performance so that they can never do any better than about 60% accuracy. So if you get a few right you know, in a row, then the trials start coming at you faster and you have less time to respond. People hate this task. Okay? <laughs> now what we find in epidemiological settings, and this kind of illustrates a point that I made earlier, is that if you, if you get about you know, 200, 300, 400 people to come into the lab and perform the same exact task, what you find is that it will create a distribution of reactivity. Okay? So what we're showing on the, on the x-axis down here is the change in systolic blood pressure 
from a resting state to when people are doing this task. All right? So the first thing I want to point out is that for most people, they're showing a rise of about 11 millimeters of mercury in systolic blood pressure. And then you have some people up here who are showing a rise of up to upwards in excess of 35 millimeters of mercury when they're doing this task. These individual differences are reliable. So you can have the same person come in, you know, on, on different occasions, have them do the exact same task, and they're very likely to show the same exact change in, in blood pressure reactivity. And this illustrates the point that this is like a trait-like characteristic of people. And epidemiologists and health psychologists and people interested in stress science are very interested in the people out here because these are the ones who are at risk for premature, for developing premature cardiovascular disease. Am I clear so far on kind of the research group? Right. Um, and again, I just wanted to point out that one of the ways in which we've established this relationship is to look at markers, preclinical markers of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and then relate them to the magnitude of the cardiovascular reaction that they showed um, in the lab. And one of the most uh, widely used markers of uh, preclinical atherosclerosis that I use in my research and that, that other people use in this field is a measure of carotid artery intima media thickness. Okay. And carotid uh, IMT, for short, can be obtained by, by Doppler imaging, uh, ultrasound imaging of the carotid artery, so it's non-invasive. Um, and uh, again, we're imaging the carotid artery, and we're taking, what we're looking at is the thickness between the intimal layer of the artery, which abuts the lumen of the, or the vessel wall, um, and the medial layer of uh, the carotid artery, which can be quantified um, quite precisely on ultrasound images. So um, what we typically do is measure uh, the intimal and the medial thickness, so this distance um, in millimeters over a segment, and then we'll aggregate all these measurements to come up with uh, an indicator of IMT. Um, IMT, again, is, is a surrogate uh, non-invasive marker that shows, that's been linked both in prospective and cross-sectional studies with cardiovascular reactivity. Um, so this is an example. On my computer, it's an example. <laughs> okay, now we go. Um, so this is an example from the, the Kyopio ischemic heart disease study. Um, and what you find here is that by quartile of systolic blood pressure response, um, those people who are in the upper quartile are the ones who are showing the greatest carotid intima media thickness um, compared to those who are showing lesser reactivity. Uh, as elicited by these standardized laboratory tasks. So this is just to illustrate the kind of relationship we typically see um, between markers of preclinical um, atherosclerosis and cardiovascular activity. Now it's against this backdrop that I've been doing imaging research. Um, and what, um, what, I've, what I've been hoping to do, basically, in this research is characterize uh, the particular brain systems and networks of brain systems that give rise to these cardiovascular reactions that are associated with cardiovascular disease risk. And it's by doing this that we can basically insert the brain into this stress health, health, health relationship. Okay, so this is the broader context for the kind of work that I do. And um, one of the things that, we've, that we first set out to do uh, in this work was essentially achieve a, a methodological goal of translating tasks that have been used in the laboratory for decades into tasks, sorry, this down a bit. Um, into tasks that we can use inside of a brain imaging environment. So we started doing this, when we started doing this, we took the Stroop task, because this is the one that, that has been used for decades, and it's the one that has been shown to elicit probably the most reliable changes in cardiovascular reactivity, and those changes in particular have been linked to carotid intima media thickness and other markers. Um, so what we did is we translated this Stroop task in such a way that it can be used in a brain imaging paradigm. All right, so while people are performing um, this modified version of the Stroop task inside of a functional MRI, we're monitoring their blood pressure 
uh, at the same time that we're imaging their brain activity. So in this way, we can link changes in blood pressure with concurrent changes in brain activity to get a better understanding of where in the brain activity is related to these changes in blood pressure. Does that make sense? So that's kind of our general, general approach. Um, so what we've done with this task is administer um, uh, Stroop, these interference trials and in what are referred to in imaging uh, jargon as blocks. Okay. So people perform blocks of trials consisting of these of all incongruent um, uh, versions of the Stroop task. So they perform one trial, then the next trial, then the next trial over the course of about a minute. And we titrate their performance again so that they can never do better than about 50% accuracy. So it's quite frustrating. And then at the end of that block, we, t we take a blood pressure reading while they're inside the scanner. And we're imaging their brain activity um, all the while. They have about uh, a 15 second period where they just fixate on a crosshairs. And then they perform a block of trials that's um, in which all of the trials are congruent, okay? And what I mean by that is that the task is ridiculously easy. So the center word um, is shown in a color that's consistent with the, with the word that the color uh, uh, is shown in. So here, um, the word blue is shown in the color blue, and then all the options are in blue. So basically, the task is very easy. So this, in a sense, becomes our, what we call a control condition. And to image brain activity, what we do is we, we take the average um, fMRI reading across all parts of the brain during this condition, and then from that, uh, from that, um, uh, that measure, we subtract our control condition. So we get, in a sense, what's called a subtraction image. So that image of the brain reveals where activity was, was uh, higher or lower relative to this control uh, condition. Is that clear so far? Okay. All right, so this was, this was basically our, so we spent the first few years just trying to translate epidemiological stressors into imaging paradigms where we could get measures of cardiovascular physiology concurrently. Um, and one of the reasons why I, I like this task in particular and um, what I've argued about in, in the paper is that Yes, the, the Stroop task is, is kind of contrived and it's very cognitive, but in a sense, if you think about what we're doing with this task, we're capturing what are arguably at least four core elements of an acute stressful experience. So while people are doing this task, they're resolving conflict, right? They're suppressing their tendency, you know, they're getting conflicting color and word information and they're suppressing tendencies um, to want to do something that, that's incorrect. They're getting negative feedback when they do this, um, particularly the titrated uh, version of the task, that so we remind them of how terrible they're doing by giving them big red X's, um, which I forgot to mention. Um, there's also time pressure. So, you know, the better you do, the faster the trials come at you, so they are experiencing some element of time pressure. And then in addition, this titration of their performance to about 50%, it has the indirect effect, effect of um, basically giving people an experience of an acute lack of control over the presentation of these stimuli. And we get ratings after the task to confirm that, that people are in fact experiencing these, these elements while they're doing the Stroop task. So yes, it's kind of contrived. It doesn't really have you know, an everyday life correlate, but in that sense, um, I think that that's quite an accurate description. But at the same time, I believe that if we're going to do the, if they're going to do this kind of work, we need standardized tasks that, in some sense, you know, embody what, what, what arguably are core elements of a stressful experience. Okay. In our imaging research, we take a particular focus on what are referred to as paralimbic uh, brain areas. These are uh, evolutionarily old brain systems that play a dual role in processing emotional information and simultaneously regulating peripheral physiology, okay? So these are brain systems that are engaged by emotional or stressful stimuli, but by virtue of their connections with brainstem and uh, lower brain areas, they can regulate autonomic and neuroendocrine outflow to target organs in the periphery. 
So they're kind of uniquely positioned to play this dual role of processing information in the environment, particularly information that might be emotional or stressful, and at the same time regulating physiology that supports adaptive behavior, particularly the kinds of physiological changes that are related to cardiovascular activity. Um, some of the key regions that we focus on are the amygdala, um, anterior cingulate, medial prefrontal cortex, and, and the insula. Uh, and in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is focus um, uh, just for illustrative purposes on our work on the amygdala, which probably some of you in the audience have heard about, uh, particularly Bruce McEwen, if you attended Bruce's talk. Okay. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the amygdala, it's a uh, cell complex, it's an almond-shaped almond cell complex in the medial temporal lobe um, that plays a broad, a broad role in assigning emotional salience to environmental events. Okay. So that's its role in information processing. The central nucleus of the amygdala, which is located, this, this entire complex is the amygdala, and it's referred to as a cell complex because it has um, depends on who you ask, but it has about 13 different cell clusters within it that all play different roles. And the central nucleus, located um, up top, plays an important role in regulating blood pressure, and this is known from animal stimulation and lesion work. Um, it regulates uh, blood pressure through its projections to cortical areas and also direct um, projections to subcortical and brainstem areas. Um, and Importantly, there's, there's uh, interesting animal work showing that lesions to the central nucleus, so if you ablate the central nucleus, you can prevent the expression of exaggerated rises in blood pressure in rats that are genetically prone to hypertension. So there's, there's strong animal evidence to suggest that the, the, the amygdala, particularly the central nucleus, is involved in regulating blood pressure, particularly in the context of, um, of stressful experiences. Okay, so far. Um, so now I'm going to uh, illustrate some of the work that we've done uh, on the amygdala and blood pressure activity in particular. Um, this, this was the, the first study uh, to address the question of um, whether there is a, a brain neural correlate of blood pressure reactivity to stress in humans. And we were given the, the, the background that I just pre pre uh, presented, particularly the, the animal work, we specifically were interested in the question of whether amygdala activation, as evoked by our Stroop stressor, is related to the magnitude of the rise in blood pressure um, across individuals. So to do this, um, uh, to address this question, we had, um, I think it was about 36 otherwise healthy undergraduates uh, perform the Stroop stressor that I just described during brain imaging uh, while we monitored their blood pressure. And what we found is that those, those subjects who showed a greater increase in amygdala activity during, that incongruent, um, during those incongruent blocks of trials, those subjects who were showing a greater increase in amygdala activity also showed a greater rise in blood pressure uh, while they were doing that task. And this is an illustration of the relationship. Um, and what we're plotting is right and left amygdala activation. Um, in relation to the change in mean arterial pressure that the subject showed during that street stressor. And the relationship was positive, it wasn't perfect, but it supports this notion that at least in humans, the amygdala appears to be functionally involved in, in mediating uh, blood pressure reactivity to the stressor. Is that clear? Okay. All right. Based on this work, um, the next question, one of the next questions that we asked is, given the relationship between uh, blood pressure reactivity to stress and uh, preclinical atherosclerosis as, as reflected by intimate media thickness. And also this finding that amygdala activation was related to blood pressure reactivity. The next question we asked was whether amygdala reactivity might be related to intimate media thickness. So to beginning to trace this pathway from brain to cardiovascular health. Um, the outcome measure that we use is the same one that I've been talking about, uh, intimate media thickness. Again, it's an indirect indicator of preclinical atherosclerosis that you can obtain uh, non-invasively by ultrasound. Um, IMT, which is, I forgot to mention earlier, has been validated against post-mortem measures of atherosclerotic disease. 
and increased uh, IMT is clinically relevant insofar as it predicts stroke incidence, infarction, and other cardiovascular events in epidemiological studies. So this is the outcome measure that we're trying to predict in this study. Um, here, instead of using the Stroop stressor, we used a task that was developed by, by my colleague Ahmad Hariri. Um, and this is a canonical uh, amygdala reactivity paradigm. As I mentioned earlier, the, the amygdala is involved in assigning emotional salience to environmental events. And the amygdala is particularly sensitive to um, social information, particularly socially threatening information. And in this task, which is uh, very, very easy, it's not stressful, um, but the objective is to choose which face at the bottom of an array matches the face in the center. Okay? So you image amygdala activity while people are performing blocks of these kinds of trials. And then you compare that with a control condition in which the objective is simply to match the shape, to um, match the shape at bottom that matches the shape at top. So again, what we're doing is we're taking a difference image. And so in that way, you can look at where in the brain activity is going up relative to this uh, control condition. Um, doing this task, uh, actually elicits reliable or, or stable individual differences in amygdala reactivity. So in a study um, that was done by my colleague Steve Manick at the University of Pittsburgh, um, he, had, uh, sub, he had people complete this task about a year apart. And he looked at the relationship between amygdala activation at time one and then amygdala activation about a year later. And he found actually, even in a small group of people, fairly stable individual differences in amygdala reactivity to this task. So giving support to the hypothesis that if you're a high amygdala reactor at one time, you're likely to be a high re re uh, amygdala reactor at another time. And in the study that we did with IMT as an outcome, what we found is that subjects who showed greater amygdala reactivity to threatening faces also showed increased carotid intimamedia thickness. And this relationship persisted after we controlled for a number of uh, confounding covariates, including resting blood pressure, age, sex, um, and I think also in this study we controlled for, for SES. So, um, so again, the, the, the bottom line here is that subjects who are showing greater amygdala reactivity to these threatening faces are more likely to show an increase in carotid intimamedia thickness. And so now, what, what, we, what we're beginning to do is characterize a pathway, particularly as, as linked by the amygdala, um, linking information in the environment, particularly stressful or socially threatening information in the environment, to patterns of physiology that, that might give rise to preclinical changes um, that are related to cardiovascular disease risk. Um, so just as an interim summary, again, we have initial brain evidence for the brain systems that are likely involved in mediating individual differences in blood pressure reactions to stress that are linked to cardiovascular disease risk. Um, these systems are in agreement with prior animal work, um, and they've also long been speculated to, to influence risk for chronic illnesses, particularly cardiovascular disease. Um, and we also have preliminary evidence that amygdala functionality is also related to preclinical atherosclerosis. Okay. So now this is, we're getting to the second part of the talk now. And this is, uh, this involves some of the next steps we're hoping to take in the future. Um, so, again, what, what I've been trying to do in my research is understand how the brain generates cardiovascular reactions to acute stressors that might predispose people to the premature development of cardiovascular disease. And if you know anything about stress and cardiovascular disease, um, you know that one of the strongest predictors, or one of the strongest correlates of cardiovascular disease is socioeconomic status. And that is to say that cardiovascular disease, along with many other chronic illnesses, track a socioeconomic gradient such that being from disadvantaged environments or chronically experiencing um, socioeconomic disadvantage is related to um, a premature expression of a number of chronic, chronic illnesses, particularly cardiovascular disease. So what we've been trying to do is understand or characterize some of the stress-related neural correlates of, of SES. Um, and th this is not, this is by, by no means a, 
an easy or simple uh, question, um, and, that, and that is because, as many of you know, socioeconomic status is both a multi-level and a multi-dimensional construct um, that can affect health throughout life. And I think, you know, in the sense that it's multi-level, um, indicators of socioeconomic status can be measured at the level of the individual all the way up to the level of entire countries. Um, it's multidimensional in the sense that you know, monetary, occupational, and educational dimensions of, of SES can be measured um, uh, subjectively or objectively. So objectively um, by taking indicators of household income, um, obtaining uh, indicators of uh, areas of, of residence, um, uh, and also uh, by you know asking questions about educational attainment, and, and um, these these indicators of SES uh, or these dimensions of SES that can affect health at you know multiple levels can also influence disease risk throughout the entire lifespan, and the correlates of, of SES range from genetic to to environmental levels, and in our research. What, what we've taken a particular interest in is subjective dimensions of SES. And we've been trying to relate uh, patterns of brain morphology and brain functionality, particularly to subjective dimensions of SES. Um, for those of you who, are, uh, who might be unfamiliar with this concept, uh, subjective socioeconomic status refers to one's perceived standing in a social hierarchy. Um, it's typically anchored to educational, occupational, um, and monetary indicators that are most often um, measured at the level of the individual or at the level of someone's parents. Okay. Um, subjective SES has attracted a lot of attention uh, recently because it's been related to a number of health outcomes independently of objective indicators of SES. So for example, um, there's replicated evidence that low subjective SES is related to poor self-reported health, um, a non-habituating uh, cortisol uh, reaction to an acute stressor. So that is a rise in the stress hormone that doesn't seem to habituate after repeated presentations of the same stressor. Uh, it's related to an exaggerated rise in cortisol in the morning hours. Um, it's related to the metabolic syndrome, which is a clustering of risk factors for cardiovascular disease, including dyslipidemia, uh, central obesity, um, uh, hypertension, and uh, insulin sensitivity. And it's also a predictor of common cold susceptibility. And most recently, um, in our own work, we found it to be related to intima media thickness as well. Okay, so in the States, um, the subjective SES is typically measured uh, by the, what's referred to as the MacArthur ladder. And this is a deceptively simple yet complex uh, measure where you give people a ladder um, and you ask them to place themselves on where they think they stand on this ladder in relation to other people in the United States. And this is the instruction set that they, that they get, if you can read this. So we ask people, um, Think of this ladder as representing where people stand in the United States. At the top of the ladder are the people who have the most money, most education, and most respected jobs. At the bottom are the people who have the least money, the least education, and the least respected jobs, or no job. The higher you are on this ladder, the closer you are to the people at the very top. And the lower you are, the closer you are to the people at the very bottom. Where would you place yourself on this ladder? And then we ask them to place an X on the rung where they think they stand at this time in life relative to other people in the United States. And we simply translate their X of where they put themselves on this ladder to a numerical score, where a lower ladder ranking means lower subjective yes, SES and a higher ladder ranking means higher subjective SES. Okay. So in our work, we've been correlating these ladder rankings uh, measured at the individual level and also at the parental level with indicators of brain structure and function. And again, we're paying, we're uh, taking a particular uh, interest in um, paralympic brain areas. Um, and in this first slide, I'm going to show you um, some of our work relating ladder rankings, adult ladder rankings measured at the individual level um, uh, to brain morphology, particularly within the cingulate. Um, the cingulate, uh, cingulate means belt in Latin, so the cingulate is a belt um, 
that surrounds the corpus callosum of uh, this white matter tract that uh, connects the two hemispheres of the brain. It's part of um, um, what Broadman originally referred to as the limbic lobe. Um, it plays a, a dominant role in processing emotional information and also regulating autonomic and neuroendocrine physiology. So this, uh, the cingulate is densely networked with areas like the amygdala and also sends direct projections to brainstem areas that regulate autonomic outflow to the heart and blood vessels and also regulates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access, uh, which is, is reliably engaged by stressors. Um, and what's also interesting, and I think you might have heard some of this work in Elizabeth Gould's talk, is that areas of the cingulate cortex show characteristic changes in structure with chronic stressful experiences. So rats that are exposed to chronic stressors begin to show changes in neural structure, particularly in areas like the cingulate. So dendrites begin to retract, cells die off, um, and there is a characteristic loss of, of, of gray matter or brain tissue volume, uh, particularly in prefrontal areas uh, with chronic stressful experiences. And what we found um, in a study of 100 community dwelling adults who were free of, of any health condition, particularly mental health condition or physical health condition, um, we found that people who ranked themselves lower, so they were putting themselves lower on this MacArthur ladder, showed a reduction in gray matter volume in anterior cingulate cortex. And this relationship persisted after we, we controlled for a number of other um, uh, confounding factors, including um, age, sex, uh, total brain size, uh, depressive symptoms, um, dispositional pessimism, perceived stress, uh, hostility, negative affect, um, hostile attributions to other people, and also markers of individual objective SES and objective community level uh, SES that we got from census tract information about neighborhoods of residence. So what this suggested was a very unique relationship between you know, perceiving yourself as standing lower in the social hierarchy and a reduction in gray matter volume uh, in the anterior cingulate cortex. Is this finding pretty clear to everybody? Some have nodding. All right, we're almost done. <laughs> um, one of the, the next studies that we did in this area, um, we shifted our focus from the cingulate to the amygdala and we also took a uh, more of a developmental perspective. And here what we asked is whether uh, subjective childhood SES is associated with amygdala reactivity to threatening or um, ambiguous emotional facial expressions. And the, the rationale for, for asking this question is, is as follows. Um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that growing up in a disadvantaged environment is associated with an increased behavioral sensitivity to socially threatening information. Increased uh, threat sensitivity um, may relate to an increased expression of stress responses that are associated uh, with, with ill health. So Eden Chen has done, done a lot of work showing that people who are raised in disadvantaged environments or what they perceive to be disadvantaged environments are more likely to show um, uh, uh, greater stress reactivity um, compared to their more advantaged counterparts. So the, 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 the conjecture here was that if lower childhood SES increases sensitivity to social threats, then lower childhood SES may predict increased amygdala reactivity to threatening social stimuli. And as I mentioned um, uh, earlier, the Amygdala um, is sensitive to emotionally salient information, uh, particularly threatening social information. Um, it's involved in regulating stress reactivity, as I, as I showed you earlier with our work on blood pressure reactivity. And also, the amygdala is an area that it, um, shows a lot of developmental plasticity. So it's, it's highly susceptible and influenced by early, environment, early environments. And this is known through um, animal work, particularly a lot of the work that Michael Meany has done. Okay, so in our protocol, we had 33 uh, first and second year undergraduate students at the University of Pittsburgh complete that uh, amygdala reactivity, a version of that amygdala reactivity paradigm that I showed you earlier, where we linked amygdala reactivity to IMT. And we had the subjects um, 
complete three different conditions for this amygdala reactivity uh, task. In one condition, they did shape matching in which all the faces were angry. In another condition, they did um, face matching in which all the faces were neutral. Okay, so that is, they, didn't, they weren't showing a particular um, emotional facial expression. And then finally, um, they completed a condition in which all of the faces were surprised. Now, surprised faces are interesting because they're quite ambiguous. You can be showing surprise because you're about to get hit by a car, right? Or you could be showing surprise because you just found out that you won the lottery. So it could be both a negative and a positive event that leads to the same facial expression. So they're quite ambiguous. So in this way, what we were able to do is look at the specificity of the relationship between amygdala reactivity to these different kinds of facial expressions and reports of subjective childhood SES. Now, um, what I'm showing here on the right is just to point out the fact that the amygdala is engaged by all of these facial expressions. So your amygdala will show increased activation to surprise faces, it will show activation to neutral faces, and it will show activation um, to angry faces. And what we're trying to do is capitalize on the variability of the individual differences in the magnitude of the rise in activation to these different facial expressions and then link that to our measures of SES. And all the faces were referenced to this control condition. And um, in our protocol, we had people um, rank their parents on the MacArthur ladders. And we basically gave them the, instru the same instruction set. And we simply asked them to rank where they thought their mother stood and where they thought their father stood up until the time when they moved out of the house. Um, so here, if you can think about our design as we have these 18 and 19 year old kids, so basically they haven't yet attained their own adult SES, so in a sense we're kind of controlling for adult SES, and what we're trying to capitalize on is variation in the subjective SES. Um, the mother and the father ladder rankings were highly correlated at about 0.8, so we averaged them together to get an aggregate measure of childhood SES. And what we found is that the lower you ranked your parents, on these ladders, the greater the amygdala reactivity you showed specifically to threatening facial expressions, such that you know, if you ranked your parents higher on these ladders, these are standardized ladder ranking scores, the higher you rank your parents, the less the amygdala reactivity you showed to these threatening faces. Um, this relationship did not exist for neutral facial expressions or surprised facial expressions. So the relationship seemed to be specific to, to, to social threats, so not to ambiguous uh, uh, social information. Okay. All right, so um, now in, in winding down, some of the, the questions that we're addressing currently, so the work that I'm doing now, is um, we are asking whether there are prospective associ associations between um, uh, neural reactivity to behaviorally salient stimuli um, and markers of preclinical disease. So that is to say, we're trying to use imaging to predict, brain imaging to predict future risk uh, for preclinical atherosclerosis. So we're doing a study right now where we're having people complete um, our Stroop stressor and then we're bringing them back in three years later um, to measure their carotid IMT again so that we have so that we can look at trajectories of increases in carotid IMT and try to predict those trajectories based on activation to our stressors with the hypothesis being that those individuals who are showing greater activation in areas like the amygdala to stress are more likely to show an accelerated progression of atherosclerosis over the course of multiple years. Um, the other question that we're trying to address now is whether individual differences in stress reactivity, um, particularly as orchestrated by the brain, partly link measures of SCS to cardiovascular disease risks. So that is, we're trying to trace a pathway, essentially, from SCS to brain function to peripheral physiology, like changes in blood pressure and heart rate, to markers of preclinical risk, like carotid intimidia thickness. Does that, does that make sense? So this is some of the work that we're doing um, at this moment, and unfortunately it's, it's, at, it's at an early enough um, stage where I don't really have any summary slides or early data to, to share with you. Okay, so 
about out of time now, which is good because the last slide, uh, I'd like to give thanks to my um, colleagues uh, and collaborators who have contributed quite substantially um, to this work. And again, I'd like to thank you all uh, for listening to me and inviting me here. It's, it was quite humbling. This is quite an enriching experience. Uh,